One of the big questions since the early days was how can we resolve the atomic structure of biomolecules using TEM? Can you briefly summarize the aspects that need an improvement in order to go from a resolution of seven angstroms to 3.5 angstroms? So obviously it goes back to, you know, in the 1930s, we had the first electron microscope. Everything about it was very crude. The electron source was crude, the lenses were crude, uh, the way you record the images were crude. And so you had to have this heavy metal stains, and it was very, very low resolution, if you like, a sort of very uh, distant view of the molecules. You couldn't see atoms, you could barely see biological molecules at all. Uh, you could see viruses and, and bacteria because they were very big. And so many, many things, say from 1930 to 1950, many things had to be improved. And uh, I guess if we jump to the current day, we do have now electron microscopy that works at one or two angstrom resolution. Um, the underlying theoretical limits uh, are the same. So all of the improvements were practical ones. So for example, um, if you want to put a specimen into the vacuum of an electron microscope and cool it down to liquid nitrogen temperature, so, so minus 196 uh, Celsius, so that the water molecules don't move around and so that amorphous ice doesn't recrystallize into a normal hexagonal ice that you get in, in, in snowflakes, uh, you have to have a very cold temperature. If you did that right up to about 1980, the specimen would immediately get covered with a um, contaminating layer of ice that was extracted out of the bad vacuums of the microscope. So the very first one was to get good vacuums, and that didn't come in until about 1980. And Jacques Dubochet was one of the first people who realized that and had a microscope in 1980. At that point, you have to take electron micrographs, images of the structure. Once you cool it to liquid nitrogen temperature, often the liquid nitrogen is boiling, so you get vibrations, and the images were blurred. And so the cold stages that work now and had a good vacuum didn't give high resolution. So then you needed cold stages. And so then once we had a vacuum and then we had cold stages, it turned out the electron source, which was usually a bent piece of tungsten wire, just like in an old fashioned tungsten electric light bulb, that did not give a very um, bright source of electrons. And so uh, in the electron optics of the focusing, uh, that meant that the so-called coherence of the illumination was not high enough. So then uh, they had to go from tungsten sources to field emission guns, which are a thousand times brighter, a uh, much sharper point, and then you get uh, much higher resolution data. That came in the 1990s. And that, after we had vacuum stages and field emission coherent sources, it turned out the detector needed to be improved. And that was where up to that point, up until about 2010, film, old fashioned photographic film, you put the electrons in, it, it goes dark just like with light. That was the best way of recording images. And so from in the last 20 years or so, the big improvement has been in the detectors. And that came in about oh, probably six or seven years ago. And then that made uh, all of the uh, different barriers had then been overcome and you could then start taking images which were much more beautiful. And then all the people who did computer-based image processing developed better programs to deal with the better images with all the better microscopes. And so, and so that's made a big revolution. So now the electron crime microscopy has become the dominant method in structural biology. If you read the, open the journals now, there's still a, a very, very large amount of work done by NMR and X-ray crystallography, but all the difficult projects and all the ones that have a high profile are all being done by electron microscopy now. Because, because all of these technical problems have now been largely overcome, there are still quite a few more uh, problems to be solved that will make the method even more powerful. So it's still on a rising uh, level of expectation. What about the issues with the negative staining method and other sample preparation techniques? Why researchers were interested in vitrified water? and what were Jacques Dubochet's breakthroughs between the 70s and 80s? So Jacques Dubochet started out as um, a young research student in Switzerland, uh, probably about 1970. 
Um, and I think he always knew that there was great potential in developing the methods further. And he was recruited to the European Molecular Biology Lab in Heidelberg in 1978 by John Kendrew, who used to be our head of division here in structural studies here at Molecular Biology Lab in Cambridge. And uh, both John Kendrew as the director and Jacques Dubochet as a young group leader in 1978 uh, they, their goal, which they stated before any work started, was to um, develop methods of making um, frozen biological specimens and to develop microscopes that would work, uh, cryomicroscopes that would work with frozen specimens. And so they put a lot of uh, resources, effort and money from the European Biology Lab into that uh, from 1978 probably till 10 years later when Dubochet went back to Switzerland. So he was there for 9 or 10 years and they developed two things. They developed one of the very first um, cryo-electron electron cryo microscopes um, that were essentially homemade with some commercial uh, components. So they, for example, they had a, a very large very large liquid helium cooled superconducting objective lens from the Siemens company in Germany that used to make electron microscopes. And they put that into a Zeiss electron microscope. Zeiss was another, two German companies. Um, neither of them do make electron microscopes anymore. Um, but in 1980, they, they built a, a microscope like that. And then in parallel, Jacques Dubochet and his group uh, mainly uh, Alistair McDowell um, and um, Mark Adrian. They were the three uh, colleagues that worked together. Uh, they were studying the properties of water when you cool it, uh, depending on how fast you cool it. And they showed, probably about 1980, that when you cool water to liquid nitrogen temperatures, depending on how you uh, carry out the procedure, you end up with either hexagonal ice, which is the same kind of ice you get in, in, in snow uh, on, on a pond in winter in, in, in just when you walk outside, or in, in snowflakes, or uh, cubic ice, which are you know, more microscopical. Uh, or if you cool it rapidly enough, you can get amorphous ice. Uh, and um, their method that they developed was to, to make a thin film of water perhaps a fraction of a micron thick, a fraction of a micrometer thick. Uh, and they did that by putting a drop of liquid onto one of the electron microscope grids that are two or three millimeters in diameter, and they simply blotted it with a piece of filter paper so that the liquid came off, but it left a meniscus that was very thin. And that was Mark Adrian's, uh, you know, the filter paper method. And then uh, Alistair McDowell tried plunging the thin film of... of water into various media. And if you plunge it into uh, liquid nitrogen, uh, that's liquid nitrogen is at its boiling point. So when you put uh, a thin film of water or a metal grid into it, the water boils and you get a, th a thin film of gas. So it cools rather slowly and you get hexagonal ice. But if you put the thin film into liquid ethane, at a temperature just above liquid nitrogen, let's say so, minus 185 Celsius, it has about 100 degrees, 150 degrees between the freezing point and the boiling point, and, and that remains liquid and it cools it very rapidly. So in a fraction of a millisecond, you've, got, you've gone from water at room temperature down to amorphous ice at liquid nitrogen temperature. And that meant that um, you know, you don't get any crystals, you get the, the molecules beautifully preserved in this homogeneous medium. And so in the 1980s, Dubochet's group was the only one in the world doing this. And he published uh, many papers, but in one review, they had 20 or 30 different biological structures, all looking beautiful, but not at very high resolution. So they developed the, uh, the method, that, and that, that plunge-freeze method is still used today. But instead of doing it by hand, uh, you now buy um, a machine. And there are about six companies that make what, what's called plunge-freeze instruments. 
in which there's a computer that controls the temperature, the humidity, the plunge freeze rate, the blotting rate, and so on. So um, that was how the method was developed, and that is the method we still use. Many people th now think there must be a better way of doing it, but, uh, and there are a few people trying this, but at the moment, uh, nobody has made a better method. But let's move to data analysis. How can we reconstruct a 3D structure from single 2D images? Can you talk about Joachim Frank's work on the development of image processing techniques to achieve this? So um, Joachim Frank was the third person who shared this uh, chemistry 2017 Nobel Prize. Uh, his background was rather different. So he came from uh, the core of the German uh, electron microscopy community, uh, having done his PhD in uh, Martinsried with Walter Hoppe. And so his background was all electron optics and coherence and things like that. But probably around about 1976 or 1977, he started to think more seriously about computational analysis of images. And whereas um, my, uh, let's say, transition from being an X-ray crystallographer to being an electron microscopist came through crystals. So I went from 3D crystals to two-dimensional crystals. Uh, Dubochet went from um, electron optics into uh, image processing of single molecules. And originally in the 70s, all the single molecules that you could look at were all uh, negatively stained or shadowed. And so er all the early work of uh, Joachim Frank, probably up to about 1990, was done on negatively stained specimens. And that allowed them to develop many of the computational procedures whereby you take a two-dimensional uh, image, like a photograph, and by analyzing it in the computer, end up with uh, a three-dimensional model of that structure because each uh, two-dimensional uh, image is a view of the molecule from different directions. And they call this, uh, for example, in whole body imaging, uh, for example, if you, if, if you have some uh, medical problem like a, a cancer tumor, uh, and you know, let's say that's in your lung or in a brain tumor or so on, you go into the hospital and they use x-rays to take two-dimensional projection images from all the different angles. And when you put those together uh, in the computer, all those different angles, there are, there are various algorithms. And, uh, you know, um, Joachim Frank was the developer of some of these algorithms. Other people developed other algorithms. The emphasis of Joachim Frank was always on the single particles. Um, and then Dubo, uh, Dubochet developed the plunge freezing method also for single particles, but in ice. And so when these methods were brought together, you ended up with single particle electron cryomicroscopy, which is the method that become quite powerful. And so those two contributed different, you could argue, different um, components of what had to be put together to make a more powerful method. Uh, whereas my uh, trajectory came from three-dimensional crystals and X-ray crystallography through two-dimensional crystals and electron microscopy, the same kind of cryo, electron cryo microscopy, but it wasn't with plunge freezing, it was just with uh, 2D crystals and so on. And then um, my transition again came probably in the, in the 1990s when it became clear that the real power of electron microscopy is not to use it as a, a method of getting diffraction patterns, which is what all the X-ray crystallographers and all the electron crystallographers have been doing, but the images were the most powerful thing. So in the end, uh, everyone uh, converged on identifying where the, uh, the key route to making progress was. And then, I guess, throughout the the late 1990s, early 2000s, uh, people were focused on that, computer programs were written, and then when the new detectors came in, everybody was kind of ready to go. And then uh, fr from 2013 to 2019, now there's been a, a sort of exponential growth in the number of people, either new people being trained or uh, structural biologists with other types of skill uh, trans transferring into the electron crime microscopy community. In 1975, you published a paper in Nature titled Three-Dimensional Model of Purple Membrane Obtained by Electron Microscopy. And 15 years later, you published another 
paper on the same structure, but you have achieved a high resolution. So can you talk about your work on the purple membrane and how were you able to achieve that resolution? When I was a younger scientist as a postdoctoral visitor uh, in the USA at Yale, um, I, I had worked previously on the structure of enzymes using X-ray crystallography. But uh, many people were beginning to be interested in proteins that were in membranes, but it was not so clear how you could do uh, that work. So I did spend a couple of years trying to work on a membrane protein family called voltage-gated ion channels. But it was clear then that that was going to be very, uh, take a very long time. The methods weren't available. Cloning hadn't been, you know, you couldn't purify things. So I was looking for a simpler protein that would be more uh, suitable for structural biology. And then uh, a group led by Walter Stachinius, who was then in San Francisco, had discovered this purple membrane, which has one small protein in it, and it's colored purple because it has, uh, in addition to the protein uh, polypeptide chain, it had what's called a chromophore, so vitamin A aldehyde, so the same thing that's in, um, well, as, as, a, as a sort of dimer in um, carotene in carrots, for example, makes the carrots uh, orange colored. Um, half of carotene makes vitamin A aldehyde. One of those molecules is in bacteriodopsin. And when it binds to the protein, it changes from yellow to purple. And that protein in the membrane of the bacterium absorbs light. Uh, pumps hydrogen ions, protons out of the cell, creates membrane potential, and then that allows the cell, uh, gives it an energy source so it can swim around and, and, and live. Um, so that was a very good um, membrane protein that was more tractable, in, I thought, in 1972 or 1973. So when I came back from the USA to the UK, to Cambridge, to this lab um, in 1973, the idea... Uh, initially was to make crystals and do X-ray crystallography. But I met uh, another group leader who is still here, Nigel Unwin, and his background was in electron microscopy. He had worked in the Department of uh, Material Science and Metallurgy in Cambridge. And then he had come here to try to develop electron microscopy methods for biology. We met up and we collaborated for about two years and without any cryo, so it was all room temperature, uh, we managed to get uh, reasonably good images of the purple membrane with this single protein in it. The protein is called bacteria or rhodopsin because it resembles, it's not identical, but it resembles the pigment at the back of our eye in the retina, rhodopsin that's used, the visual pigment for, for, uh, for human vision. Um, so it's sort of bacterial, but it wasn't bacterial vision. It was bacterial energy transduction. And so we got a, a seven angstrom structure, which showed uh, alpha helices in the protein, just like they had found in myoglobin in 1957. And so when we published that 1975 paper, we copied the title. So the original paper was uh, the structure of myoglobin using X-ray crystallography. So we said, okay, the structure of purple membrane using electron microscopy. And in 1975, we were pleased. It was the first membrane protein structure. It showed transmembrane helices. We were very pleased with that. But nothing that we did uh, said that the resolution should be only 7 angstrom, should be low. Uh, in principle, we put the specimen in the microscope. We take a picture. It should diffract to any resolution you want. So we actually spent quite a long time trying to work out why it didn't go to a higher resolution because then we want, we'd get the atoms and we could get the chemistry and the structure and so on, the mechanism. And in the 1970s, we actually thought the main thing was maybe the, the film wasn't very good. And then after the film, we said, well, maybe the, uh, the instruments that digitize the image on the film, the film scanners, they weren't so good. So we spent years trying different films, making, building better and better film scanners and so on. And then we tried uh, to other methods, we tried to, instead of taking images, we thought we could take diffraction patterns and use the methods that the X-ray crystallographers had developed, all indirect. And none of these turned out to be powerful enough. And it was in the end, it was 
the development of the cryo microscope. So the Dubochet was one of them, Bob Glazer, several people developed cryo microscopes. And then through the 1980s, uh, we had one here, it wasn't as good. We went to, or I went to Berlin, um, Berkeley in, in San Francisco, um, and uh, EMBL in Heidelberg, where Dubochet had this uh, liquid helium lens. So there were three microscopes, and we got images from all of them, and they all went into the analysis. And so uh, using the, the very early prototypes, homemade uh, electron microscopes, collaborating with these three groups, we finally got enough data to get an atomic model in 1990. So that was it's 15 years, but you know, it wasn't all, it was 15 years we were doing different things at each stage, uh, trying to get to the bottom of why it wasn't working. And then in the end, we, we got a structure, but we needed um, many images and many molecules. And we, we realized, probably 1990, that although it had worked and we got a structure, and this is a kind of model of the structure, um, this is made soon after that, actually. It uh, has, has about five or six side chains, and it's got this long molecule in the middle is the, is the vitamin A aldehyde. We realized that uh, you know, the methods, although we got a structure, they were still uh, very... The, the amount of uh, signal that you extracted from the image, it was a tiny, tiny proportion of what you ought to. So we, we reckon we used about... 5,000 times more data than we really needed. And so although it was working, uh, the improvements that came after that uh, made a 1,000-fold you know, a improvement. So if you were to try and do this again, it would take you just a, you know, not, not very long, an hour or two, 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 15 years or something like that. So the, me the methods and the instruments and all the equipment and computational methods, they've all greatly improved now.